My name is Dr. Ken Webb, and I'm a research associate at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. I was brought in to help design and build a yellow perch hatchery as part of the farmery in Green Bay. Yellow perch are, unlike most freshwater fish, they're very difficult to rear in captivity from egg to fingerling. Um, once you get them to fingerling, they're great. Perch have a very much more complicated life cycle from egg to larva to fingerling. They require live prey. You can't feed them on a what normally you would feed a crumble to tilapia or to bluegill. They, they require live food. And then there's a really big die-off. We call it a critical period. When you try to transition them from what they're eating that's alive, the little zooplankton that's swimming around in the water, and you try to transition them to dry feed, perch are one of those fish that will just go, nah, I'll die. And, and just won't eat it. They just will not eat it. Tilapia have been in culture for a very, very long time historically. And they're very good at it because they lay eggs, they mouth brood, they protect their young. They, um, they tolerate very dense culture conditions. They tolerate very poor water quality. So tilapia as a cultured species is really one of the best you can rear because they're tough, they're hardy, and they protect their young. Perch are much more difficult than most any other fish that you're used to in the aquaponics, and especially aquaponics in Wisconsin. Very difficult to rear during those early stages. People ask a lot, why do you raise, why did you decide to raise perch instead of other things? The first is the historical significance of perch to the region. Yellow perch really built a lot of the fishing industry in the Great Lakes. Yellow perch is a keystone of our diet in this area. So there's a lot of recognition for the species. There's a lot of understanding uh, in the marketplace. It's known, people will buy it, they know what it is. Second, perch, because it's such a keystone in our diet here, it has a value that other fish don't have. Tilapia, as great as they are, have a very low value because tilapia can easily be reared in large extensive ponds in South America, Central America, or Asia, and then shipped over here frozen. Tilapia grow best in water that's far above the water temperature that's natural around here. Perch, you don't have to do that. So our building right now in the state that it's in is currently at 60 degrees. Tilapia would go dormant in this and they would not grow at all. Whereas perch, this is kind of right in their happy point. So in an energy cost and in a local cost, perch makes much more sense than something like tilapia. We're essentially domesticating fish, just like you domesticate any animal. The problem with perch is you can only get them at certain sizes at certain times of the year because nobody's producing them indoors right now. Some fish would be fine with hammering and sawing and grinding, perch not so much. They really had a lot of trouble adapting to that and we had a lot of trouble keeping up with our last minute kind of temporary systems to bring them into culture, keeping them healthy. So um, we, didn't, we didn't have very much success on that first round of domestication. Those that did survive all of that stress are now the perfect brood stock because we have essentially selected for fish that are tolerant of noise and people and culture conditions. We, we did a very harsh winnowing <laughs> of, of the weakest of those fish. But that's, that's the problem with domestication is we're selecting for certain traits. And the first trait we have to select for in a cultured animal is we have to select for fish which do well in that culture situation. The ones that survived are absolutely, we've got plans in place to tag those, mark them, and carry them through because they have already demonstrated that given the worst we can throw at them in terms of noise and condition, they're fine with it. There are three principal areas of the fish's life cycle that we have to worry about. The adults or our brood stock, 
the eggs and larvae, the very small fish, and then the fingerlings, which are the juveniles that we can then send wherever, whether it's other aquaponics places, our own aquaponics, or out to people who want to raise them in ponds. So the problem with broodstock is actually getting them used to culture, getting them used to feed. So the first problem is with broodstock to get them domesticated enough that they will thrive in captivity. So that domestication process is the first problem. The second problem, which is lesser a problem, and I'll go to the other end, is fingerlings. Fingerlings grow very quickly. They have a high metabolic rate. They're at warmer temperatures than most of the other fish because they're, they're more in the summertime. And so the problem with them is keeping their water clean because to raise a commercially viable number of fingerlings, and we're talking in the hundreds of thousands, you have to have very clean water and it has to be cleaned very rapidly and very often. So if I'm going to raise 100,000 fingerlings and I'm putting, let's say I'm putting 10 kilos of food into that tank a day, I have to have a system that's capable of dealing with 10 kilos worth of metabolic waste. And that's kind of where aquaponics comes in because aquaponics does that cleaning for us. That all of that waste, instead of having to deal with it, it's something we actually want because it feeds our plants. Now, the hardest part of the whole process is the eggs and larvae. Because eggs come in skeins, because the larvae are very unformed, it's what we call an altricial larva. They don't, they're not little copies of the adults yet. They're essentially little protoplasmic blobs. So they have to go through ontogeny. They have to develop the muscles and the bones and the gills while they're swimming around in the tank and eating. And now we're trying to replicate the natural system and increase survival. Rather than having five or 10% survive, we want 100% to survive. And that's a problem. That's really difficult to do. Indoors, we don't do volitional spawning. Volitional means they do it on their own. So in traditional um, pond side perch culture, you let them spawn out in the grass beds and then you just go out and collect the skeins out of the grass, right? And you bring them inside and hatch them out. Um, and that works fine. It, it's, it's been working for decades. It works great. The problem is you're limited to one natural spawn per year. We're bringing them indoors, and so we want to have four spawns a year. We want to have them off-seasoned so that whenever somebody wants little fish, we're able to provide them and they're ready to go. So, Volitional spawning doesn't work for us, so we manually express, it's a, it's a fancy way of saying we squeeze the eggs out of them. So we watch the fish, we watch them develop, we know when they should spawn based on the time of year cycle they're in. We watch them as they start to hydrate the eggs, the females will get very rotund, they'll start to get round. And when you see that she has fully hydrated her eggs, we'll express a few, look at them under the microscope, make sure they've reached the proper level of development. And when they have, we'll pull those fish out for that day, manually express the eggs into a bowl, and then take some males and manually express milt on top, mix it up, make magic happen, put it in the tank. When this building was originally designed as an aquaponics facility, the plan was to get egg skeins from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Um, those egg skeins were gonna be purchased there, brought up here, hatched and reared. Um, a number of things happened that that did not work out. Um, but the largest, problem with that is you still need somebody who knows how to raise and feed those larvae. We have a collaborator right now in Minnesota who's been working with UWM for three years and has still not had a commercially successful production run even though he's been doing it for three years. And that's because learning to care for these baby fish is hard. It's not something you just pick up. It, it takes time and practice. And if you only get one or two spawns a year, that's it for your year. You get one or two attempts and then you wait a year again. So within Green Bay, we have a lot of interest in urban and suburban uh, aquaponics. So it really was kind of a no brainer to bring somebody in who could kind of bridge that expertise gap. And that's why I'm here rather than one of the true experts who have been working with yellow perch for years and years. I, this is really my first time to work with yellow perch. I've worked with freshwater fish before, 
But most of my recent past, I've worked with very difficult to raise and some very easy to raise marine fish because yellow perch share a lot of similar characteristics to marine fish that they have altricial larvae and you have generally a very low survival in the wild of the offspring. So that's, that's kind of my wheelhouse. It's kind of where my expertise is. Here we get to interact on a very fundamental basis with the community and that's, that's really a, a very positive thing that I wish more people had the chance to experience. Mm -hmm.